physically present here today is uh, Mr. Dipankar Das, who is also from the US, but he has traveled down for this occasion. He is the Group VP Technology for Commercial Trading and Marketing Business Function, Marathon Petroleum USA, uh, Digital Levers, uh, to improve commercial performance at process industry. This is going to be his, uh, uh, his uh, topic of address today. So may I request our HOD, Professor Rojo Chakraborty, to come up and felicitate Mr. Dipankar Das. Mr. Dipankar Das being felicitated by our head of the department, Professor Roju Chakraborty. Please welcome Mr. Dipankar Das and our head of the department, giving him the memento, the kit, and of course, flowers. It is over to Mr. Dipankar Das. Next to join the online. How might I handle the go up and speak with the handle. It is an extreme honor that uh, the university has given us to be here and uh, talking to all of you. Uh, to Rajat Babu, to my seniors, my batchmates, and all the students here. First, I think uh, to be a part of the university, which uh, is working on and publishing many, many research and academia. You heard Shiddhato Das speak about it yesterday. Uh, it was uh, amazing to hear that. It's also an honor that uh, Dr. Professor Masalkar was speaking in the morning, and I'm standing in the same place. I, j I just can't believe I'm here. Uh, a chance to speak here in the same forum. My talk today is about digital and process industry, but I think, and this is for all my student friends here, uh, I think fungibility is key to uh, an engineer, and especially chemical engineer. I think uh, luminaries like Dr. Sharma, Professor Masalkar, they, they spoke about it in, the, in their own different ways, uh, especially chemical engineering. I, I do not think digital, cyber, IT is the, is the kingdom of computer science engineers. I don't believe it, and it's up to you to believe that. And that's the reason I chose this topic and the role I am. And, and you don't need to go there. In, in the company I work, um, Two very, very important role we report into the board. One is the head of cyber, the CISO, and myself. Both are from the industry, continuously for entire 30 years of our career. Both are chemical engineers sitting in those roles. Second, there have been great references for India. I'm proud to be an Indian. I'm proud to be a Jadupurian, and I go on saying that in the different roles, and when I introduce myself, I. Uh, they call me an Indian Mafia, and I'm proud to be an Indian Mafia. Uh, and because what they talked about, what we bring to the, to the world of science. I mean, look at the number of execs sitting in the world as the CEOs and the next level, right? When I joined this company, I'm the first brown-skinned guy sitting at a level below the board. Right, there, was, there was a young engineer from Jadupur who works in the IT, and he works in the IT. Interesting, right? He, he came in and told me, a Bengali guy, and he came and told me, sir, but I just said, why not? I mean, it's all up to us to, to handle that, right? The world is changing, and the world will change, and I think we as Indians, uh, we as chemical engineers can do things differently. We don't, don't need always to be IT engineers, right? and MBAs. I mean, of course, I've done, done work in ops research 
and, and then for energy economics. But, but at, what I do day in and day out, end of the day, is process industry. I mean, I was talking to some of the board members a few weeks back, and, and these companies are understanding that when they bring the role, even in Indian oil, their head of corporate IT is a Jadupurian, uh, I think, metallurgy graduate, 1986, if I remember correctly. So this is, this is to my student friends. If you want, you have a dream, you go and get the world. I have to talk a little bit about myself and the Marathon Petroleum. I'll probably not take more than a minute or two. Uh, Marathon Petroleum is like the Indian oil of America. It's the fourth, uh, fifth largest refining capacity. It's 130 years. Uh, I still go to this building you see in the picture. Uh, this building, I mean, on the side, there's still gas lights. And this was in 1800 something when it was built. It is called Standard Oil, Amoco. It's sort of broken and become a num number of pieces. We are industry leaders in environmental responsibility. We have three of our refineries have been converted to renewables. But I have my theory of renewables. I was talking to some people below. Uh, uh, first of all, it's very expensive. Second, if you think about the whole commercial world, I do not think Saudi Aramco will allow much of all this research to come. I mean, the state I stay, you know, the government is saying 2025, all, it cannot produce and sell uh, non-electric vehicles. I mean, what will happen? We'll create a second-hand market all around Utah and Nevada and stuff like that. Uh, it's not that because I'm an oil and gas guy, I have, you know, I'm, I'm not believing in those things, but I'm just saying it is very, very difficult the way the, the fossil fuels are still there. We process about 3 million barrels of calendar day of refining capacity, 13 locations, three of them been converted into renewables. Uh, it's a commercial organization, so we got rid of a lot of our retail stations, unlike we see in India, 8,000, over 8,000 retail stations which we still uh, run. And uh, we do a massive amount of uh, natural gas processing, and uh, we have about 100, 100 old terminals. But again, the way the industry works, they're slightly different, not own ownership and stuff. The world is changing. Why? Because uh, if you look at post-pandemic, the global supply had to go down. And it's all chemical engineering. It's a fascinating chemical engineering and a chemistry-related reason why the refineries had to go down. Because you have to produce a particular product in when you break up a crude oil, which is called jet fuel. The jet fuel have to be produced, and the jet fuel is about minimum you can squeeze out and put everywhere else, it's about 7 or 10% of most of the crude oil we process in the world. As the aircraft stopped flying, there was a problem because what do I do with the jet fuel? You cannot run a refinery without producing jet fuel. We try to make more jet fuel, that's a different story. But, and therefore the refineries had to cut back to 30, 40, 50% sometimes and they're coming back up. So there was a major change in the supply and demand scenarios. The Russia-Ukraine war, war which is going on, I mean we, can't, we cannot buy in America any Russian oil. India has done a smart thing to get a lower priced contract of the Urals. It's a great crude. I've operated with that. And secondly, the last year, in spite of all the turmoil, we and the oil industry made the most money. Even January was very, very strong. $25, $30 a barrel. So it could fund a lot of research, a lot of work there. So, so then if you look at the uh, the left side of the screen, the innovation and technology which is happening today. I mean, when we were engineers or in the early days of my work, if you want to put a heat exchanger or, you know, if you want to put a sensor, you have to take the unit off, you have to make holes inside it, you connect it. Today, you have all these wireless sensors going everywhere. I was doing a project for a multinational before I, I joined Marathon. I used to work for Deloitte, I worked for Accenture. So they had a major expensive unit where uh, the bottom bearing will break, right? The bottom bearing will break and they could not afford it because that's a produced in a very small volume but it goes to the racing cars. What we realized was if we do not control the particular viscosity of the, the liquid that comes in, it forms little smaller chunks and it drops on the bottom bearing and breaks. 
I mean, we put like loads of sensors continuously measuring if there is any clunk formation. And we, what we realized was all going back to the amount of heat generation to keep it on a liquid form at a particular density and specific gravity and the mix of the fuels coming out of the refinery. So sensorization has become so, so cheap today that, that, that we can actually control everything literally sitting. There's a project being done, I think by BPCL or Indian Oil here. They're talking about sitting in a central room and stopping a truck being loaded at a particular terminal. They don't need to go and stop it there. The whole, the behavioral aspect have changed, right? Uh, the whole consumption, the mobility trends, right? You know, people love talking about uh, electric cars and, and things like that. The CNG as a transport fuel and other things. So all of this together is actually making us think that we need to operate differently, we need to bring efficiency differently in, in whatever we do. But when you talk of digital adoption, I mean, everybody says we are digital, right? And people will say, okay, am I really exploring digital or I'm being digital? Does oil companies and process industry need to really go and being digital, does it need to be apples of the world? No, none of us are thriving to be apples of the world. But at the same time, Exploring digital in their own pieces will not help. If you don't look at it holistically, it's not about me talking about it. It's a, it's a very interesting study Solomon has made, and my whole talk is around that one slide. So what we are saying is we need to become digital as the process industry, but doing digital will not do. At the same time, we cannot be the G's of the world or, or Apple's of the world or Microsoft of the world. That's not the business process industry plays. So, so let me talk through this slide and this critical. Solomon Associates, who many of you know, are, is the company which benchmarks how the process industry works, especially refining and chemicals. They say that 60% of the money is gained or lost in that top, uh, in the top circle there which is the value chain optimization, the crude you buy, the feedstocks you buy, the products you made, how you make, and so on and so forth. About 30% is about asset reliability and operational efficiency, about 28 point something they say. And about 10% sits in what we, the left one, which is corporate processes, hydrocarbon supply chain, the spare parts, spare parts you collect or not. And therefore, once we start thinking about this, one needs to focus, and that's what's happening, right? Think about, this industry, I think we graduated in 85 by about 95, uh, 96, you know, we had LPs optimizing refineries. We had all sorts of simulations, uh, simulation engines coming in uh, and, and talking about how we operate the units. Uh, you know, we had advanced process control. Actually, this industry, to my experience, I think was one of the first to be digital because we had DCSS donkeys of years back. Right? I mean, I think when we were very, very young. But why are we still talking digital? Why we are still exploring or doing digital? Because majority of these initiatives were isolated in silos, right? We were doing, in each pockets, we were doing great work. What the study says is not about the three circles, right? Yes, we know that's where the money, you run great optimizers, do a great amount of planning, get your feedstocks in the right sizes at the right time. We talk about you know, asset predictivity. In fact, nobody talks of predictive asset management anymore. We talk about collaborative asset management. We talked about you know, from reactive to predictive to prescriptive to now collaborative. What does it really mean? It basically means that I, I want my units to operate perfectly, all my equipments, but I want it to be operating in a way which makes most sense for the part which makes more money for us. How do I trade my crude? How do I trade my product? What product, what portfolio do I create? And therefore, what we are talking about, it's those intersecting Venn diagrams is where we have to be careful about. You create a great plan, you run your simulators, you give an instruction, Saudi Aramco actually runs an LP based on the demand and pricing they actually run a fifth degree polynomial equation LP, which then connects into a high sys simulator, which then simulates the exactly cot temperature and pressure, and they actually predict at what 
composition of the crude oil that has to be produced, bringing what qualities for every C numbers that comes up. And that production, and they also decide that how much they will run the compressors to actually pro decide, do I produce more gas, do I produce more liquids? And because they could start doing it one, they could actually produce whatever the customer demanded. What crude they want? Do I need more Arab heavy? Do I want more Arab light? All their 86 wells, all their 86 wells. And then they will produce the exact amount of gas in the exact amount of carbon composition which we, which we need to serve the industry. Why? It's that intersection of the value chain with the production supported by the right amount of the non-hydrocarbon supply chain works. I mean, which is essentially, you know, spare parts, your, your materials, your forklifts. The industry has gone so far ahead. I was in a project with Petronas, where as the planner produces and says, based on the demand, this is the amount of, and a similar work was done by, I think, Siburkem, Russia, a few years back. The exact amount of the PET bottles, the amount of tires, the plastic bats, or the smaller rubber materials, it goes into the warehouses. It gets produced exactly in the same amount. The controllers, with the, with the help of edge compute, actually, now advanced process control has moved away from central control rooms. A lot of advanced process control is actually happening on the equipments. These are, there are very high powered HP clustering engines which sit on top of the equipments, absolutely intrinsically safe. It actually controls the unit. It produces that, goes off to the warehouse. It is kept into the racks where it should be. The, uh, the forklifts are RFID controlled. They will come in and exactly pick up the right amount of materials from each shelf and then come back and, and push that into the truck. So it's that intersection which is very, very important. The people who don't make money, they miss those interactions, right? You can great plan, great production, you can say, oh, I need a shutdown. I optimize my shutdown, and I said, this is the best turnaround of a process equipment. No, it's not one equipment, right? It's multiple equipments in a refinery, especially the high complex 11, 12, 13 Nelson refineries or the chemical plants. It has to be coordinated that I want to shut down or not want to shut down. I, will I run my equipment at an efficiency level which will actually be maybe burning my equip, uh, equipment faster and bringing down to a shutdown, but I will actually manage the hydrocarbon supply chain because I'll make more money there. So it's not about predictive asset management. It of course has to be safe and reliable. I mean, that's the number one. And now the cyber is another interesting factor which has come in, right? All these computers are fantastic, but you are attacked every other day. We were attacked in the, in the pipelines three times recently. But how do I really connect these dots, right? How do I connect these dots? How do I look at this, each of these interfaces? So the major transformation work we are going to do now